my Lord of Jehovah. He is filled by the will of the Lord. He is filled by divine right. He is filled calling us home. Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel. Well, Tom. <laughs> Jacob claimed this place, although his uh, uh, grandfather had already received the covenant for the whole land. He was heading north. He stopped here and uh, had this adventure in Genesis 28. That's right. And, and how did Jacob get here? What was he doing here in the place he named Bethel? House of God. The yeah. house of God. Well, of course, last uh, program we talked about Isaac and Ishmael and how there was a division between the two. And God, through Abraham, gave Isaac the promise of the land. But to Ishmael, he gave the desert areas of Paran and the Sinai Desert and said that he would bless Ishmael. But to Isaac would go the promised land. Now we have the next generation. What would happen? Because now we have uh, two twins. We have Jacob and Esau who are born of Isaac and Rebekah. Well, even from the time of, uh, before the birth of the twins, God revealed to the mother, Rebekah, what would happen. He told Rebekah that Jacob would be the superior, and Jacob was uh, the second born of the twins, and he was the one that was to receive the promise. Later on, when uh, there was a controversy between the two boys, uh, Esau had gone out hunting and had come back famished. And there Jacob was preparing a meal of lentils, lentil soup. And uh, Esau wanted some of that and uh, said, give me some of that. And Jacob said, if you will give me the blessing, if you will sell to me the blessing, then I will give you this soup. And uh, so they made the transaction. So by the promise of God before they were born and by the purchase, Jacob now had uh, possession of the promise, of the covenant, of the land. But even later, he was heading on his way up to Hamath and he stopped here overnight on this uh, hilly area of Bethel with all these rocks around and spent the night here. Took a pillow and propped it up so that he could lay his head upon it and slept. And we read a remarkable story of what happened as he slept. And he came to a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in all thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And he was in a plain where, from a high hill here at Bethel, he could sure <laughs> see in a lot of directions. That's right. Uh, 
I, Isaac was down here at Beersheba and he'd made the trip going northward and uh, through uh, what we know as Jerusalem today and on up to Bethel. And he was heading up to this area to his uncle Laban's place to, uh, to get a wife. Remarkably, the Lord reiterated the covenant there clearly, uh, which he'd made with Abraham. If I lay over the map of modern Israel, uh, Bethel is in the center of what is called the West Bank, occupied territory. That's right, Zola. The, the West Bank is uh, indicated by this line that goes here, and of course it indicates what's called the West Bank uh, of the Jordan River, and it's really Judea and Samaria. But this is the area where, in Bethel, where Jacob stopped and spent the night, and God made this great revelation to him, showed him the great uh, ladder, and told Jacob that uh, the covenant was being reiterated to him. That just as uh, God had promised the land to Abraham, so now the land had passed on through Isaac and to now Jacob, not Esau. To Esau, other lands would go, Edom. Uh, was the inheritance of Esau. That's on the other side of the Jordan River. God would take care of him. He was a descendant of Abraham too. But to Jacob would go the land, the promised land uh, that we're uh, at today. So we came to this spot to show where the covenant was reiterated and it reiterates throughout the Old Testament. It wasn't just said once but many times as each generation came. Given to Abraham, then Isaac not Ishmael, then Jacob not Esau, and uh, continually claimed again and repeated again by the Lord. But ironically when we come out to this place uh, we're in a kind of enemy territory. <laughs> we had to take um, well reasonable precautions. We had to be careful. We are uh, driving through uh, villages where other languages are spoken and other gods are worshipped. Uh, we hear the call of the Muzain from the local mosque. Uh, and, the, and it's no question that uh, Bethel itself, this hill, the surrounding villages and so on, is a hot spot in the modern intifada. And the irony is, <laughs> it was right here that God went to this trouble and provided this amazing dream, this unforgettable image, Jacob's Ladder, uh, which is on the, everybody's doorpost and on their stationery here and so on, of, of the Jews, uh, picked this place uh, to single out as a place where the covenant was reiterated so that it was very clear. Jacob was impressed, there's no question. When he got up in the morning, he performed this religious ceremony, this act of faith, this anointing of a stone, not unlike, I guess, when, when an explorer finds new territory or the astronauts came to the moon, they, they stand on the surface, they claim it. Uh, Jacob did the same thing because of his strange night vision, uh, an encounter with the angels and uh, with Almighty God. It's a pleasure, isn't it, Tom, something special to come to the very site. Here we have uh, uh, God talking again as he did to a grandfather and a father and not to the son. And now the land is being reclaimed yet again with the settlement uh, close by here in Bethel. I'm glad we could come here and show it to you. The maps that are being used on this series are key to our understanding of God's everlasting covenant. Our source of study was the Macmillan Bible Atlas, the same atlas we showed to Rabbi Grodner on our program about Abraham and to the Palestinian journalists on the program about Isaac and Ishmael. On future programs, we'll discuss in detail the specific boundaries given by God to Moses. To verify our source of reference, we talked to Ronnie Reich, head of the Documentation Department of the Israel Antiquities Authority, and asked him about the reputation of the authors, Yohanan Aharoni and Michael Aviona. Yohanan Aharoni and Michael Aviona were my teachers many years ago in two different uh, subjects. Yohanan Aharoni uh, taught at the Hebrew University uh, historical geography. That was his main uh, subject. That is the identification of sites mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in other sources, with the area, with the land. If a, if a place like Chatzor or Gezer or Jerusalem are mentioned there, where exactly on the site uh, they are. Um, so this was his main subject of interest, uh, especially for the Old Testament times, ancient biblical times. Michael Aviona, who was professor of classical uh, studies, 
uh, also one of my professors, did the same for the later period. Aroni was interested mainly in the Negev, in the southern part of the country. And in the northern Galilee, his, uh, his PhD thesis was on the uh, settlement of the Israelites in the northern Galilee, that is, on the Lebanese uh, border. So uh, he, I think, was uh, the authority on historical geography. But again, this is a combination of fieldwork and uh, study of the scriptures. This is not called the land of the Quran. It is called by everybody the land of the Bible. When we return, we'll talk to former Israeli ambassador Moshe Arel about God's covenant with the children of Israel. So much of what I've been reading and studying for 20, 30 years as a Christian here in this short time has just come to life. It's real. It's not just something on the pages of a book now. Come with Zola and see the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For tour information, write Zola, 12268 Dallas, Texas, 75225. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for uh, sharing with us again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you because with your uh, vast experience with many governments, I, I think you understand how things go on behind the scenes. I try. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's a... Uh, a funny time we live in. Uh, Israel is being criticized. Uh, they are uh, building on other people's land, pushing the people aside. Obviously, you have represented Israel. Uh, well, what's your view? What the Arabs usually refer to as Arab lands are not Arab lands at all. They were Ottoman state lands. They were British crown lands. They were Jordanian crown lands. They were not private lands. And so they are government lands, and wh whoever is the government has the land. So in other words, uh, the, the Turks had it, the British had it, the Jordanians have it, now the Israelis have it, it's, it's, uh, it belongs to the government. I think in the United States you have the same kind of thing. What do you call them, public estate or oh, yes, uh, land, federal land, uh, that, uh, that does not belong to any individuals or companies. Uh -huh. And that is the bulk of the land that we are talking about. Yeah. The, the Arabs have a way of referring to everything beyond the old green line as Arab land, yeah. but it isn't. Some of it is Arab-owned and some of it is not. Yeah. Then again, uh, the, the political status of all these territories is undecided. Uh -huh. They cannot say it's theirs. Uh -huh. We have as good a claim to it as anybody else. Someone said there are two myths operating here. One that uh, uh, these are uh, historically Arab lands. There always was an indigenous Palestinian culture. And secondly, that the Jews don't belong here at all. <laughs> How do you answer those? I've heard uh, Arab spokesmen uh, make unbelievable arguments, uh, even in the United Nations. They, they have a way of using whatever argument uh, they feel will help them at a given moment. And uh, many of these arguments are completely uh, without the foundation. I don't know how anyone who even knows the Quran, let alone the Bible, could uh, suggest for a moment to himself, let alone to anybody else, that, uh, that Jews don't belong in the land of the Bible, that the people of the Bible somehow doesn't belong in the land of the Bible. This is not called the land of the Quran. <laughs> it is called by everybody the land of the Bible. So I don't believe the Arabs themselves believe what they say when they argue in this manner. Is it possible that the Arab leadership just doesn't really represent its people? It is a fact. It's a fact. Of course. There is no, as you know, democracy doesn't exist in, in the Arab East. Uh, and therefore, they, they don't. Not in the way that we understand people being represented. In, uh, in government. So when the Syrian authorities say come to a peace conference, they're really arguing their own agenda. You are right. This negotiation, the present negotiation now, which President Bush uh, called as a negotiation for a deal which will consist of land for peace. Uh -huh. uh, I've read uh, a better definition, yes. <laughs> Obje objective, not Israeli, in a, in a British weekly, in a famous British weekly called The Economist. Yes. And, uh, and they felt that the best way to describe 
what is at stake now, what is being argued about, is land for promises. Land for promises. Not land for peace, but land for promises. Yeah. I mean, land is to be given away yes. in this uh, equation. And peace will only consist of a promise. You weaken yourself when you uh, give up land for peace and that just invites another attack. Certainly in this case. Uh, I think it may be a good idea to compare the areas in question now with the territorial situation when in, we negotiated peace with Egypt. As you know, we not only gave away territory, we gave away a lot of territory, and, but also oil fields, yes. which we had developed when we were holding those territories. Now, in the case of Egypt, the distance between that border and Tel Aviv is about three times the distance between here and the River Jordan. Israel is regarded as, as not really wanting this peace conference. It's not a very palatable project for Israel. Well, I, I, feel, I regret that people think that way, and I should have thought that the example of our peace with Egypt should have set to rest uh, all uh, these notions that we were not interested in peace, that we were interested in territory. As I just said, we gave away huge territories. No, I think we are negotiating uh, more than sincerely. Uh -huh. uh, yes, because we want peace. But uh, as a famous Englishman, I think he was prime minister some centuries ago, said rightly that uh, a, the test of a peace treaty is the degree to which it makes another war unlikely. Uh, that is the test. And uh, to, have to make another war unlikely, all over the world you find uh, people making sure that they have powder and that they keep their powder dry. Mm -hmm. Uh, even now, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, no one is dissolving NATO. Ah, uh -huh, that's right. No, of course Everybody's not. Everybody's keeping their weapons. And uh, in the Middle East, uh, the, the life of a nation that has no credible defense can be awfully short. Uh -huh. So uh, here, the need is peace, uh, but a durable peace, a peace that will hold. And as the United Nations, in its uh, famous resolution number 242, the Security Council, the uh, United Nations recognized it in that principle, in that resolution, very well, because it uh, gave Israel the right, uh, black and white, in the language of the resolution, to live in peace without secure, uh, behind secure borders, free from acts and threats of Force. Let me come to a prediction on your part, if I can. You've been uh, the ambassador or the first secretary of many Israeli missions to different countries for so many decades. What do you think is going to happen? It will be a long negotiation, but it's, uh, we stand a pretty good chance, I think, of, of reaching a settlement, finally, provided that uh, the Arabs in the course of this difficult negotiation, do not get the idea that they will, in one way or another, get third parties to twist our arms or to force us to make concessions which we could not, in honesty, make without risking our security. And that means if they realize that the only way to improve the present situation from everybody point, everybody's point of view is to reach an agreement, is to negotiate until an agreement is reached. And that, in fact, is precisely the spirit of Security Council Resolution 242, because it speaks of an accepted settlement. Well, let me ask you to characterize then what sort of settlement will result from all this? Will Israel give land for peace or what? Uh, in my opinion, this will be decided by our public, our public opinion, no matter who is in the government. If the Israeli public is convinced that uh, the Arabs are negotiating in good faith and that they mean to put an end to this conflict, I think the willingness to pay a territorial price, which means taking heavier risks, uh, will be increased. I think you, you, the public as a whole 
will have a pretty healthy feeling about whether they are serious or not. Uh -huh. And I think that will be the decisive factor. Compromise is, uh, I think, inherent in, in the concept of negotiations. Ne negotiating <laughs> means making compromises. I think that is understood. The Syrians don't seem to understand it so far. They, they are insisting on, on total unconditional withdrawal. I don't know, they may not be able to read English properly. They cite the resolution, but I don't think they read it, so to speak, yeah. sometimes. And uh, I think that is the best answer you could get. This, in, in this democracy, it will be public opinion in the end, and the Arabs have to convince not only our negotiators, but also our public that uh, they are serious in uh, intending to bring this conflict to an end mm -hmm. and to let us live in peace, free from acts and threats of force thereafter. And uh, that will take some convincing in view of their record. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us once more. You're welcome. talk with uh, Ambassador Iroh was so interesting. It was earlier in the year, and uh, of course this uh, peace conference so-called goes on, and, and I know you have written to me. My, my view hasn't changed on that. I don't trust it. I, I don't think it's going to lead to peace. Well, ultimately, I think it sort of presages the peace conference in which somehow Israel will sign a peace treaty with a uh, someone who promises to be their savior and turns out to be the Antichrist. That is, uh, they won't think he's a messiah, but they will uh, sign up for him for with him for protection and so forth. And maybe this pr present peace conference leads that way or sets a stage for that other one uh, later. I don't know. Uh, I don't trust the Syrians, and I never did. Uh, they share a border with Israel. It, obviously, as, as the ambassador pointed out, the uh, distance uh, from Egypt to Israel, or even uh, Jordan, at least over to Jerusalem, uh, is, is uh, uh, there's a buffer zone in between in both cases, but uh, the Golan Heights uh, look down on uh, Israel. That is, when Israel has them, then they have a line in the ground with Syria. If Syria would ever have them, they would have the high ground. And from uh, 1948 to 67, when Syria had them, they would just shoot innocent civilians and, and lob rockets down on the Sea of Galilee and so on. 
I, d I don't know how else to put it. Syria is a dictatorship, not a democracy. It's, it's, it's a bloody dictatorship. Uh, this <laughs> president, so-called, in quotes, President Assad, bombed his own village of Hama, 20,000 people were killed. I, I'm not talking about a small thing. The Intifada in, in five years has, has uh, there have been 800 casualties or so, less than that. He killed 20,000 people in a few minutes with, with his own bombers. And, and uh, th this kind of, of, of maniacal uh, dictator cannot be trusted, of course, to make peace or do anything else. Uh, Syria's not a real country. It's, it's simply a... a, a mm, a gang of intimidated people in the hands of, of a gangster. Excuse me, I think I can back up that position. Uh, what's going to be ahead? Uh, uh, President Clinton uh, wrote, uh, President-elect Clinton wrote uh, position papers uh, that our ministry received from several viewers on a pro-Israel position, which I like very much reading, but I don't know if I can rely on them to really carry it out. I, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's reported to me he grew up in Little Rock in a not in Little Rock, but in the town where he grew up, there were Jewish people, and he had uh, contact with them. He may have a soft heart toward Israel. I don't know. It, uh, frankly, it's got to be better than the past administration, almost no matter what. This peace conference was a re-election bid. It didn't work out. I hope we can stop it now and, and, and get back to the most peaceful times we've had is, is a strong Israel defending itself, and that's the end of it. Our offer tonight is about Israel, uh, of course, and, uh, you know, when I offer these things, I also appeal to you for funds to keep these shows coming. There's just no other way. If you'll help us, I will be grateful. If you will send $10 to us, we will send you our Pilgrim's Map and the uh, Israel's Right to the Land book and our bumper sticker, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. Call it the Divine Right Package, and it's $10.00. These three items, just, just call it the Divine Right Package, and I think uh, you'll get a thrill out of that. All three of these things have been very popular in our ministry, so we decided to combine them. So thanks for your help, and Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.